Today we get to tour one of over 400 parks in the National Park System. I'm super excited because we're taking a walking tour of the George Washington Carver National Monument in Diamond, Missouri. This is an incredible park that celebrates the life of a truly remarkable human being. I'm going to take everyone along for a tour of the Carver Trail and the Visitor Center. The whole place is amazing and you can easily spend a good two to three hours here. We're going to try to cram it all into roughly a 10 minute video. We're going to start with the one mile hike on the Carver Trail. This is a self-guided loop that will take you through a tall grass prairie, woodlands, and across some streams. I'm honestly taking this trail in reverse today because the heat index was well over 100 and I wanted to kind of save the shady section for the second part of the walk. Along this path, you will get to see the bust of George Washington Carver. You'll get to visit the graves of Moses and Susan Carver. You get to see and experience the 1881 Moses Carver House. You get to see the Williams Pond and the Boy Carver statue. It's a really enjoyable walk and the history and the visuals provided along the way are extremely well put together. Following our hike, we'll go inside the visitor center and tour a couple floors of exhibits there as well. To discuss and go in depth on George Washington Carver as a person, I'll be citing National Park Service material as well as essays by Peter Duncan Picard. I'll provide links in the description for that content as well. So let's talk about Mr. Carver. Let's start from the beginning. During the Civil War, guerrilla warfare intensified along the Missouri-Kansas border. Born a slave on the Moses and Susan Carver farm in about 1864, George Washington Carver was caught up in the turmoil. When George was just an infant, outlaws kidnapped him and his mother Mary. George was found in Arkansas and he was returned to the Carvers, orphaned and nearly dead from whooping cough at the time. His mother was never found. He never knew the identity of his father, although George believed he was a slave on a nearby farm. George's frail health freed him from many daily chores, giving him time to explore. He would say, day after day, I spent in the woods alone in order to collect my floral beauties and put them in my little garden I had hidden in the brush. The flowers thrived under his care, and George acquired the nickname the plant doctor within his community. George would leave the farm in about 1875. He never again lived with the Carvers, but many of his values were shaped during his years on this farm. His life work was rooted in his ability to retain the child's wonders of nature. George longed for an education to help him understand nature's mysteries, but school was denied to him. When he left the farm, he was roughly age 11, and he went to seek these answers out on his own. His quest led him through poverty, prejudice, violence, and injustice. Eventually finding himself rejected from college due to his race, he tried his hand at homesteading in Kansas. Finally, in 1890, he was accepted as an art major at Simpson College in Iowa, where he was the only African American. Within a year, his desire of preparing to serve his people forced a painful decision to leave art. Carver transferred to Iowa State Agricultural College, today's Iowa State University, to pursue agriculture. George would say, the more my ideas develop, the more beautiful and grand seems the plan I have laid out to pursue, or rather, the one God has destined for me. It really is all I see in a successful life. He earned a Bachelor of Agriculture degree in 1894 and a Master's of Agriculture degree in 1896. That year, Carver accepted an offer from Booker T. Washington to head the new Agriculture Department at Tuskegee Institute, Alabama. The Post answered Carver's dream to be the greatest good to the greatest number of people. At that renowned school for African Americans, Carver became a beacon to students who were inspired by his ability 
to overcome so many obstacles. His peanut work began about 1903, and it was aimed at freeing African American farmers in the South from the tyranny of King Cotton. With innovative farming methods, he convinced Southern farmers to grow soil-enriching crops like soybeans and peanuts in addition to cotton. At the heart of his vision for an economically rejuvenated South was his teaching that nature produced no waste. Embracing a message of hope to help the man farthest down, Carver produced a series of free agricultural bulletins that provided information on crops, cultivation techniques, and recipes for nutritious meals. Several of the 43 bulletins were distributed throughout the world. Carver came to public attention in 1921 with his captivating testimony before a U.S. Congress House Committee that was debating a peanut tariff bill. Two years later, he converted young Southern whites at a YMCA retreat into near disciples. They arranged for him to speak at colleges where no African American had been welcomed before. Carver became a symbol of interracial cooperation. His work and knowledge of plant properties impressed Thomas Edison and Henry Ford. Both would seek out information from him on industrial use of plants, including peanuts and soybeans. George Washington Carver had a timeless message for humanity. Yet he became famous not for his great wisdom, nor for his brilliance as an educator, but for transforming peanuts into products like ink, paper, soap, glue, dyes, massage oil, milk, cosmetics, and more. It is not so much for his specific achievements as the humane philosophy behind them that define the man. It is not the style of clothes one wears, neither the kind of automobile one drives, nor the amount of money one has in the bank that counts. These mean nothing. It is simply service that measures success, Carver would say. Carver was motivated by his love for all of creation. For him, every life, a tiny fungus in healthy soil, the ever-present flower on his lapel, a forest bird, a human being of any complexion or nationality, was a window on God and a mouthpiece through which the great creator spoke. He saw all living things as interrelated. His vision brought forth his teachings. A successful life is one of service through helping others. Real education helps us understand life, bringing us the kind of happiness that inspires us to help humanity. True religion is expressed in love and kindness towards all life. Science worthy of its name is truth, which sets us free. Every facet of Carver's life and his teaching, including his peanut work, can be traced inward to reveal a genius whose source is the deep creative fountain of the inner spirit. When you visit the George Washington Carver National Monument, you are introduced to this humble man whose love of God and agriculture became a ministry to benefit humanity. George Washington Carver would say, as a very small boy exploring the almost virgin woods of the old Carver place, I had the impression someone had just been there ahead of me. I was practically overwhelmed with the sense of some great presence. I knew even then it was the great spirit of the universe. Never since have I been without this consciousness of the Creator, speaking to me through flowers, rocks, animals, plants, and all other aspects of His creations. Carver died at Tuskegee on January 5th, 1943. That July, Congress designated George Washington Carver National Monument, the first park to honor an African-American scientist, educator, and humanitarian. The George Washington Carver National Monument is an incredible place to visit, and yet another incredible place in the four-state area. I hope you guys enjoyed today's episode. Until next time.